Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for more than 40 years, we have invited voices of conscience to address the issues of our day from an ethical perspective. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and I am the moderator of the forum. Our hour-long forums are always free and open to the public, both online and in person. In fact, we'd like to take a moment to celebrate that today is our first in-person forum in nearly two years. Yeah. It, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here in person or by live stream or on Minnesota Public Radio. However you are here, you are part of the Westminster Town Hall Forum community. The health and safety of all of us here and in our community are still our top priority. We are limiting the audience in the sanctuary to 400. We're requiring masks in the building. We're foregoing any food or drink. We will continue to adjust our safety protocols as together we move through this COVID-19 pandemic and thank you for getting vaccinated. Whether you are joining us in person or via live stream, we are grateful you're here. This forum is presented as a service to the community, powered by this community. 85% of our support comes from individuals such as you. If you're able, please consider making a donation to the forum. You can do so on our website, westminsterforum.org slash donate. westminsterforum.org slash donate. Today's the first program in our season on this series on democracy. We have invited four dynamic speakers to grapple with how democracy has been a, a tool for social and racial progress and how it has also been employed to marginalize communities based on race and class. Each speaker will talk about the role that we have together as a community in renewing democracy and ensuring that it works for everyone. We invite you to visit our website to learn more about our upcoming speakers, Dr. Wendy Chun of the Digital Democracy Institute, Latosha Brown, the co-founder co of Black Voters Matter, and the Honorable John R. Tunheim, Chief Judge of the United States District Court of Minnesota. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker. Jose Antonio Vargas is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Emmy nominated filmmaker, Theatrical producer, he's the author of the best-selling memoir, Dear America, Notes of an Undocumented Citizen. Ten years ago in 2011, the New York Times Magazine published a groundbreaking essay he wrote in which he revealed and chronicled his life in America as an undocumented immigrant. A year later, he appeared on the cover of Time Magazine Worldwide with fellow undocumented immigrants as part of a follow-up cover story that he wrote. A leading voice for the human rights of immigrants, he founded the nonprofit media and culture organization called Define American, and he's wearing his colors today. <laughs> That's been named one of the world's most innovative companies. In 2015, MTV aired White People, an Emmy-nominated television special that Mr. Vargas produced and directed on what it means to be young and white in a demographically changing America. Most recently, he co-produced Heidi Schreck's acclaimed play, What the Constitution Means to Me. It opened on Broadway in the spring of 2019, and it opens this week at the Guthrie Theater here in Minneapolis. Please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Jose Antonio Vargas. Um, I think I should start with this. Since I am undocumented, I think it's important to show the documents that I do have, and it's my COVID vaccination card. So. Just make sure I do that. Um, it's really a privilege to be among all of you today. First, I'd really like to thank uh, Tain Danger, Tim Hart Anderson, and the advisory board of the Westminster Town Hall Forum for inviting me um, to join this august and distinguished group of speakers who have addressed this very audience in this forum since 1980. I found that out. 
So this forum has been around before I was born. I was born in 1981, and I feel really honored to be a part of it. I was looking at some of the photographs of the speakers, and one of them is Gwen Eiffel, who served as a mentor when I was at the Washington Post. It's really wonderful to see her photo, and that I'm going to be included in a photo with her, so some spiritual communion. Um, I'd like to extend my really my gratitude to all of you who have made this tremendous effort to be here, physically be here. I don't know about you, but ever since this pandemic began, all those months ago, we had to stay home and shelter in place, wondering the circumstances in which we'd feel safe and comfortable being in communion with other people. My sense of community has invariably heightened. Like in other words, if I'm gonna show up in a shared space at the same time, surrounded by other people, the event better be worth the effort. In other words, I will endeavor to be worth the effort of you coming here today. Um, I have been asked to give remarks about what democracy means in the eye of an undocumented citizen. I got the pamphlet and I've been looking at it as I prepare my remarks. First off, um, let me say that I cannot possibly represent 11 million undocumented immigrants in this country. Out of those 11 million people, I don't know if you all know this, an estimated 10,000, about 10, 100,000 of them live here in Minnesota, the majority in the Twin Cities. I don't know if you know that, that there are about 100,000 undocumented immigrants living and working and calling Minnesota their home. And I cannot presume to speak for all of them because we are as diverse as any group of people. Second, as a writer, as someone who's made a life giving meaning to words, I think we must really define our terms. For me, being undocumented means I don't have the legal paperwork, the right legal documents to prove that I'm legally supposed to be here. I'm just curious, asking the audience, how many of you have a US passport? Raise your hand. Amazing, congratulations. How many of you have green cards? Just curious. Um, this is a question that I've been asking in many, many communities before the pandemic. I've done about 1,800 events, that's panels, interviewing people, filming people in 49 states. And there's been many instances where people have asked me <laughs> why I haven't gotten deported. Uh, the last event I did was in Jackson, Mississippi. And let me just say that it wasn't as welcoming <laughs> as it's been here the past couple of days. And I asked this question about documents because I think it's actually really, really important to remember that part of the reason why people are here without legal status is because they don't have the right legal documents to show government. Now, I have all kinds of documents showing that I am here, that I'm physically here in the United States. For example, there's this mail I get from the IRS <laughs> they seem to know where I am, right? And I'm more than happy to accept their mail and to write them the checks. I don't know if you all know this, but contrary to the dominant narrative that elected a president, undocumented workers actually pay billions of dollars in taxes. Undocumented immigrants in the state of Minnesota paid an estimated 190 million in federal taxes and 108 million taxes in state and local in 2018. That's from a nonpartisan research study. Now, I prefer the term undocumented because it speaks to the fact that my legality, such as it is, is measured by documents I don't have. All the while making sure I remind myself and I remind others that our lives are worth more than pieces of legal papers that we may or may not have. Now, I came up with the term undocumented citizen when I finished writing my book Dear America, notes of an undocumented citizen. And you can see that. I actually underlined the word citizen. I started writing this book um, in 2017, about a year into the Trump presidency. When Trump was elected, I was living in Los Angeles, in an apartment in Los Angeles. And during that time, I was on TV quite a bit, MSNBC, Fox, CNN. And my landlord, right, really friendly man, Indian American man, South Asian man, um, <laughs> approached me two days after President Trump was elected president and said to me, I am not sure how safe you would be here 
anymore. You know, I, I was living in Los Angeles, the epicenter of the undocumented population in the country. He said, you may want to move out. And I remember looking at him going like, wait, I paid the rent on time, right? <laughs> and he said, I just, I'm not sure if I showed up, and I don't know if you remember this, there was a time when there were ICE agents and flights, right? There was a chaos around what Trump, Stephen Miller, and Steve Bannon were actually going to do. And so I remember I had this apartment, and ever since I was a kid, and when I found out that I was here illegally, the first thing I had to do was get rid of my thick Tagalog accent, which is really, you know, it's, Tagalog is a mix of Sanskrit and Spanish, right? So it's really kind of vowel heavy. And I did that by watching as much PBS and Frasier as I possibly could. Right? I just figured if I could sound a little bit like Bill Moyers and maybe get some Frasier and Niles. And then at that time, this was in the 90s, um, around that time was the same era that hip hop and R&B were becoming the dominant music genre. So I figured if I can go hip hop and Bill Moyers, I will be okay. And I remember to myself, success in America meant having an apartment like Frasier's apartment. Do you remember the apartment? It was like a huge apartment, right? And at that time, I had finished making this documentary for MTV called White People, um, which for me was a really important piece of work, just because this was in 2015. Um, a year before that, it was revealed that for the first time in American public schools from K to 12, white students were no longer the majority. So I wanted to do a film, it's on, actually on YouTube, so you can check it out, all about what does it mean to live in a country where white people were going to be the minority. What was interesting about this film was MTV actually commissioned a study that was released with the film, and they surveyed millennials, white millennials and millennials of color. What was interesting was they found right, that three-fourths of white people live in predominantly white towns, which I suppose is also the reality in the great state of Minnesota. I just saw the census figures and we saw that the growth in the Twin Cities and the urban areas did not reflect the growth in the rural parts of Minnesota, right? And many people live in white bubbles. And then part of the study actually also showed that 90% of white people have predominantly white friends. And then for me, this was the most stunning statistic. And again, this was 2015, half of white millennials who were surveyed said that discrimination against white people were as big a problem as discrimination against people of color. The documentary aired in July 2015, a month after President, well, Donald Trump announced he was running for president, right? And it was interesting making that film because I had to really grasp with the reality that you cannot talk about immigration in this country without talking about race in this country. And since I am in Minnesota, right, Norwegians, Dutch, Finnish people, I have always wondered, because you know, my introduction to Minnesota was Rose Nyland from the Golden Girls. And you know, she would talk a lot about all those Swedish things. I don't know, I don't know what she was talking about. But it was always interesting to me. So all these European, all these immigrants from Europe, the Swedish, the Finns, the Irish, all of those people, how did they get to be white? Like, how did that happen? And it's the same process of melting into this thing called whiteness. Is that happening with Somalis, people from Somalia, people from China, people from Mexico, people from the Philippines? Are we expecting that people are supposed to kind of melt onto this thing? Is that the expectation? So after I did that documentary, I was paid for it. Um, and the reality for my life that's probably the most surreal is after I came out as undocumented, I can no longer be employed, right? I had spent a decade of my life being employed by the Washington Post or the Huffington Post or the New Yorker, you know, doing business with these companies. I could no longer do that. And as you can imagine, I have a lot of lawyers. And one of the lawyers said to me, hey, Jose, you can actually be an entrepreneur and it's the only way for you to make a living. So I had to become an undocumented entrepreneur. <laughs> And then I started thinking, wait, isn't that actually the most immigrant thing there is? 
right? That immigrants are entrepreneurs. So that's how I was making a living. And so I made money from the documentary from MTV. I got the Frasier apartment. And then my landlord says, hey, you may not be safe here. So then I decided to put everything I own in storage. And I decided that I was going to leave, like self-deport. At the time, I was 38 years old. And to be honest with you, I don't want to be a full-time undocumented person. <laughs> I don't want to be the person that goes all around the country trying to tell people, hey, I'm here illegally. There's 11 million of us. When are you going to get your act together and get us the citizenship that many of you take for granted? I just, it was exhausting. So I wrote this book. And really, what I really wanted to understand was my own mental health. Like, I wanted to understand my own sense of um, disorientation, right? And when I was writing this book, you know, after I finished it, I didn't want to, it seemed insufficient to use the term undocumented immigrant. You know, I've lived in this country for 28 years. This is where I was educated, where I built a career where I've created a life for myself. And I realized that because I'm not a citizen by birth or by law, I've had to create, and immigrants like me have had to create and hold on to a different kind of citizenship. I would call it a citizenship of participation. Citizenship is showing up. <laughs> and these days, citizenship is masking up, right? Citizenship is using your voice while making sure you hear other people around you. Let me repeat this, because it's really important. Citizenship is using your voice while making sure you hear other people around you. Citizenship is knowing and believing and acting like you're in community with other people. That my freedom, such as it is, is dependent on other people's freedoms. You know, I'm from California, and as you know, we just had this incredibly expensive recall campaign. A few weeks ago, after flipping through this voter information guide that was mailed to my home, like some sort of like a joke, <laughs> right? I get this information, voter information guide, realizing, of course, that as an undocumented person, I can't vote. So I'm flipping through it, and I started counting up all the pivotal elections I've witnessed firsthand, but have not participated in. The recall campaign against Governor Gray Davis. I actually covered that when I was a reporter for the Chronicle in San Francisco. The elections of George W. Bush, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and Joe Biden. All the local and state elections in all the cities where I've lived, from Washington, D.C., to New York City, to Los Angeles, to Berkeley, where I now live. So again, in my 28 years living as an undocumented citizen, I've never voted in an election. And the California recall election was a reminder of a paradox, this paradox, at once heartbreaking and numbing that undocumented immigrants find ourselves in, even though we are an integral part of California and Minnesota and states all across the country, we are mere bystanders relegated to the sidelines while voters decide the fate of our state. And when you're undocumented, the fate of the state and the basic conditions of your life are often inescapable. So can we keep, for example, driving legally? California is only one of 15 states, plus the District of Columbia that allows undocumented residents to apply for driver's licenses. I'm sad to report that undocumented Minnesotans cannot legally apply for driver's licenses. So this is my driver's license from California. I'm just showing you all my documents now. Um, so I'm lucky that California is one of those states, but at the very top, of this ID, it says federal limits apply. So it's called a marked license. Many states that have allowed us to drive have, have opted for this marked license. So when I go to the airport tomorrow to, to fly back home, or if any police officer or sheriff sees this, they actually would know that it's a marked license. And I was telling a few friends last night that on my way here, I was going to rent a car. You know, I'm an Avis Wizard member. I was going to try to rent a car last night and when I arrived on Sunday night, and I had to remind myself that this license is only valid in California. Right. Mind you, again, 100,000 undocumented Minnesotans, how do they get around? 
Is there like a subway system that I'm missing here in Minneapolis? I don't think I saw one. So to go to work, <laughs> to go to church, to go to like, you know, grocery stores, to drop their kids off to school, how do they get around, right? This question of can low-income undocumented residents age 50 and up qualify for state-funded health care? This summer, California followed Illinois in expanding health care for older members of its undocumented population. Federal law bars using U.S. tax dollars to provide coverage for immigrants who are in the country without authorization. So that's not the reality here in Minnesota. This question, which is really, really important, can undocumented students continue to pay in-state tuition rates? When Governor Jerry Brown signed a package of legislation making college more equitable in 2011, California joined 20 other states, which I'm proud to say includes Minnesota, in helping secure a more affordable education for undocumented youth. But here's a fact that most people don't know, that most of the media, my colleagues in the mainstream media, don't contextualize. Undocumented immigrants are not islands unto ourselves. We live among documented relatives who are U.S. born citizens, naturalized Americans, or legal permanent residents. Among my large but tight-knit extended Filipino American family of almost 30 people in California, I'm the only one who's undocumented out of 30 people in my family. And the past few weeks before the election, I spent the weeks checking in with all the aunts and the cousins and the grandma and the grandma's sisters just to make sure that anybody who was eligible to vote was voting. Right. And I have to be honest, you know, being reminded by the theme of this lecture, this conversation today, it's painful, <laughs> this severance between ourselves and the government that our hard earned tax dollars help fund. And I'm using that term very intentionally, severance, right? It is a separation. So what does it mean for 11 million people, 100,000 of whom are here in Minnesota, to be a part of society but yet not be a part of society? What happens when you actually internalize that you don't belong here? What happens to you? What happens to your community? Where do you find belonging? Like where do you find community? In the early days of the pandemic, when it became clear that undocumented workers were deemed essential, many felt that society thinks of undocumented people as labor, right? But not necessarily as people. We're essential workers, but are we essential enough to get the documents so we can keep working? Now, if your vote is your voice, right, then surely undocumented people are human beings deserving to be heard guaranteed a voice in civic life. I, I've been rec recently finishing uh, Robert Caro's, you know, masterful biographies of Lyndon B. Johnson. And I arrived at this quote in one of the books that said that for President Lyndon Johnson, a man without a vote is a man without protection. For decades now, for almost 30 years, I felt unprotected in my own country. And that is what democracy means for an undocumented citizen. I remember thinking, welcome to the undocumented life. I remember reading an, an essay in the Wall Street Journal by Susan Orlean, one of my favorite writers, and the headline of the essay was, never taking travel for granted again. The subheadline: crossing the globe had never been easier <laughs> until the coronavirus reminded us of the real meaning of distance. And I remember thinking, I've been socially distancing for decades. Undocumented immigrants have been doing that for decades. You know, as I wrote in Dear America, I haven't left America since arriving here in 1993. If I leave, there's no guarantee I'd be allowed back. So I haven't traveled outside of the US to see my mom, for example, or to see my siblings in the Philippines for almost three decades. I see the world online and experience other countries through movies, televisions, and books. Because I'm here illegally, there are certain things I cannot do forcing me, forcing people like me to think outside of the box and to figure out how to open windows when doors are shut. I always have to adapt. In some ways, my undocumented condition prepared me for the limitations of this pandemic life. And I've learned to really value my resilience even more. And I've leaned on my community, 
the community of people who have welcomed me in this country even more. The last thing I'll say, um, I had the most surreal thing happen a few years ago, actually after the book was published. I was contacted by the superintendent of the school district that I attended as a sixth grader, and they were deciding on renaming an elementary school. And there were a few options, Steve Jobs, because he had attended the school district, Barack and Michelle Obama, because Barack and Michelle Obama, and then somebody put my name on the list. And I remember telling the superintendent, is this like a joke? Like, can you legally do this for someone who's not here legally? How does this work? And I remember thinking, oh, this is so cute, but it's not gonna happen, you know, like, this, no. And I was surprised a few months later when he called back and said, you know, we heard comments from the teachers and from parents who are attending the school district, then your name won out. So it's gonna be Jose Antonio Vargas Elementary School. I know, it's crazy. You gotta love America though. You gotta love America, right? Like, I don't know how that happened. And then the, the students had to pick the mascot. And you know, I was kind of hoping, you know, I don't know, Panther, I, I don't know something. And I guess the kids probably looked at my eyebrows and they picked owl. <laughs> the golden owls, right? And I'm saying this because the last time I was actually surrounded by a community of people was at the opening ceremony for the school. And I remember to make sure to invite Mrs. Denny, my high school choir teacher, who was the first adult outside of my family um, that I came out to was undocumented because she wanted my choir to go to, Hawaii, to go to Japan and I told her that I couldn't go and she changed the trip to Hawaii. I made sure that my high school principal was there, uh, Pat Highland, who made sure that I was able and afford to go to college. She's now on the board of directors of Define American. I made sure to invite Georgia Nakano, this Japanese American woman, um, who was probably one of the most smiliest people I'd ever met. And it wasn't until three years after I met her that I knew her own family story. She told me that her um, family was actually interned during World War II. And you know, I spent all of my high school years not driving, because you know, we couldn't, I couldn't get a driver's license. And so Georgia Nakano drove me around. <laughs> she would drive like 20 miles per hour and the limit was like 40. So we were always the slowest car on the road. And Senora Kilmer, my Spanish teacher, who said, Jose, I know you're not Spanish, but your name is Jose Antonio Vargas. So, donde esta la biblioteca? It's the only Spanish I know. Where is the library? So when the school was open, I was surrounded by Mrs. Denny, Georgia Nakano, Pat Highland, Jill Denny, and all the teachers and mentors I ever had. Because here's the reality, right? The reality is if my freedom cannot come from this government, then it has to come from people who in the past almost three decades of my life have made me feel free in this country. I certainly hope that there are Georgia Nakanos and Jill Denny's and Pat Highlands all across Minnesota, making sure that 100,000 people in this state can be as free as they need to be so that they can be a part of this democracy. Thank you for having me here. Thank you, Jose Antonio Vargas. We're grateful for your wisdom. The owl is a symbol of a wise bird, by the way, so you're in good company. This is the Westminster Town Hall Forum coming to you from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister here at Westminster Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker today is Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Jose Antonio Vargas. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I would like to thank our broadcast partner, Minnesota Public Radio. For the first time ever, NPR is broadcasting this fall's forums as a special week of pro programs. You will be able to hear all of our programs this fall on democracy, including this one, each day at 11 a.m. during the week of November 29th to December 2nd, right after Thanksgiving, day after day after day, the Town Hall Forum on NPR with this series on democracy. 
Of course, all forums are also available at video uh, as a recording at any time on our forum website or on our Facebook page. Thanks as well to our media partners, MinPost and the Sahan Journal. Today is our first forum of the fall season focusing on democracy, and we invite you to learn more about our upcoming talks with Dr. Wendy Chun, Latasha Brown, and Chief Judge John Tunheim on our website. And now, Mr. Vargas, if you are ready, I will present the questions, and you will return to the pulpit. First question is well, okay. uh, about the narrative of America. There's this narrative out there that we're a nation of immigrants. And uh, can you respond to that when you, when you hear that? What, what does that stir up in you? Well, first of all, I used to say that because I have this tremendous book by John F. Kennedy called A Nation of Immigrants. It was published in the late 1950s. And then I found out actually that the same publisher of this book published that book. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's, it's a really, probably the most important primer on the country's immigrant history. So much so that John F. Kennedy actually broke down. Like, did you know that there were 1.7 Italians, 1 million Italians that moved to this country in like the 1800s, in the early 1900s? I didn't know that. So I used to say that. And then I'm gonna answer your question by sharing two anecdotes. One, I was in Birmingham, Alabama in 2012. I was meeting with members of the NAACP, the local chapter, and I started talking about this country being a nation of immigrants. And this elderly African-American woman got up and said, Mr. Vargas, with all due respect, we're not immigrants. That was such an important lesson. Lesson learned. Right? And then a few years later, when I was filming white people, we were at the Pine Ridge Reservation. And I was filming this documentary there. And this young Native American woman, I guess she had sent me a private message on Twitter. I didn't see it. Um, she pulled me aside and she said, hey, I'm glad you're here. You can't talk about immigration without talking about us. So this young Native American woman said that to me. And the reality is we can't talk about this country being a nation of immigrants without acknowledging the very distinct history that Native Americans and African Americans who are descendant of, of enslaved people in this country. Now, the other thing I'll say about this, it's not a coincidence that both of those groups of people have had to fight for their citizenship. We did not acknowledge citizenship of Native Americans until the 1920s. You could argue that the Black Lives Matter movement is about citizenship, right? Uh, one of my friends, Alicia Garza, she's one of the co-founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, she said to me that the Black Lives Matter movement is about citizenship too, right? She said it's citizenship as being seen as a person with dignity, right? Who have been here and have built this country. So that, that's the way I'd answer that question. I got a question here from one of the students in the audience. Who did you come to America with? Can you tell a little oh. bit about the story of how you got here? So I woke up one morning and my mom said I was coming to America. Uh, and the suitcase was already packed. Uh, there was no time to take a shower. I remember that part because I thought I stunk. Um, and then I got to the airport and my mother introduced me to this man who said was my uncle. But again, I'm Filipino, like everybody's my uncle. You know, so I didn't really think anything of it. He was my uncle, and at least according to my mom. And then he was my seatmate on the Continental, this is how long ago this was, there's no more Continental Airlines. It was Continental Airlines that I flew on. And then when we got to Los Angeles, he was there with me, and then that's when my grandparents actually met me, right? And then that was when my grandfather gave me this green card, um, gave me this green card, and then four years later, I found out that the green card that my grandfather gave me was fake. And then I found out, after I found out that it was fake, then I found out all the other lies my mother and my grandparents told me, which is that guy wasn't my uncle, that he was actually the guy that my grandfather paid $4,000 to smuggle me here. And $4,000 is a lot of money for my grandfather was a security guard his entire life here. Uh, he passed away in 2007. I, I don't think he made more than 
$7 an hour as a security guard. And my grandmother was a food server. When she retired, she was making like six fifty dollars an hour. And by the way, God bless everybody fighting for a minimum wage and a living wage. So, um, so for, for, for these, you know, Filipino immigrants to have saved up $4,000 to get me here was a lot. And then again, I was 16 when I found out all the lies. I remember one of the questions I asked them was, why didn't you do this the right way? Like, why? Then I found out that there was no right way, that grandparents cannot petition grandkids. It's not because some of them were like, hey, how do we get you legal? Can we just adopt you? And we went through that process, um, and they couldn't because I was already over the age of 18. So what I'm underlining, by the way, is how incredibly complex the immigration system is, right? It's not one size fits all. Another question from a student in the audience. What is the place that you would consider home? That is your house, family, friends, et cetera, your community. What is home for you? It's where I bake. <laughs> I learned to bake during this pandemic. And <laughs> thank God for YouTube. And I did, I'd never baked before. And I didn't know that the great thing about baking is you learn this thing called precision. Like when it says three-fourths a cup, it means three-fourths a cup. Like don't mess with the thingy that says it's three-fourths a cup. And then I don't think I've ever felt <laughs> as, I don't think I've ever felt quite as welcomed as I felt last year learning how to bake in my own home. And like actually making time for myself to bake. And then my grandmother thankfully loved the cake. I think she said she loved it. Um, so there's the physical home, which is the kitchen for me. I can't believe I'm saying that. Um, and then I think there's the spiritual home. Like for me, I don't think anything will ever top that elementary school. Like I don't, and to this day, I have to really be conscious. I used to be a cop, I used to cover cops. I used to be a police reporter. And <laughs> Because of that, I had to learn how to like curse a lot talking to cops. And now I have to always catch myself. Because Thank you for doing that. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> because not only that, but because the parents of the students who attend the school follow me on social media. And when I say something a little bit problematic, they let me know. So there's pressure that comes with the elementary school thing. And then there's also this, I wish my grandfather were alive. Um, I don't think he would have predicted that any of this would have happened. And um, I think the fact that this school exists, I hope represents the sacrifice and the risks he took that when I was a kid, I didn't understand. So I think the school represents somewhat of like a spiritual home. Your grandfather, your Lolo. Yeah. Uh, played a key role in your life, uh, raising you, supporting you. You also had some differences of, of opinion with him along the way, which you've talked about and written about. Uh, what do you think your grandfather would say now in, in the sort of the public persona you have become? What would your Lolo think of you today, you think? Uh, now, this is probably a cop-out. I don't think of myself as having a public persona. I just think that's... That's too exhausting to think. I'm, it's hard enough for me to think of myself how I am to now have to think of what the public thing is, right? So I don't think in that way. But I think my grandfather, his favorite, I'm Filipino, karaoke is like, you know, religion for us. And his favorite <laughs> uh, song was My Way by Frank Sinatra. And one more for the road. Hmm. And sometimes fly me to the moon. And so when I drive now, where I can legally drive in California, I usually sing along to those songs to like have some sort of communion with him. He was very, my grandfather was very religious. I think maybe he, you know, Catholic, right? And he went to church pretty much every night. And I think he was asking for forgiveness not only for himself, but for me. Um, I think he would have he would have liked to have listened to my version of my way. <laughs> I think that's what he would have liked. 
And you certainly did it your way, didn't you? <laughs> I suppose. Uh, yes. Another question from a student, uh, and this maybe is about this, what, what many of us think of as public persona, Jose Antonio Vargas, whom we know of as author, filmmaker, et cetera. Do you feel like you have privilege and are treated differently from other undocumented immigrants being in the public eye? Does it affect how you use your voice? Ah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you're probably looking at the most privileged and documented immigrant in America. Um, that's just a fact. Uh, it's such a fact that when I was arrested 2014, I was detained. And people forget, right, that Barack Obama actually deported more immigrants than any other president in modern history. He also detained hundreds of thousands of people. And for eight hours, I was one of them. But after eight hours, I was released. And I actually wrote a little bit about it in the book. And I still, to this day, don't know exactly what happened and how I got released. But I do know that there are four million Filipinos in the United States, many of them nurses. <laughs> and they, if the nurses just organized, they may want to get me out of ICE. And so I think the, my privilege got me out of that detention cell. Now, I have to say, as somebody who's worked really hard for whatever it is that I have, I have this really complicated relationship with privilege. And I think really when it comes to privilege, the question you have to ask yourself, because we all have some sort of privilege, I think the question is, what are you doing to risk your privilege? So I would argue that what I've been doing for the past decade is trying to risk whatever safety I feel. When I, was a, when I was a high school student, I met, was introduced to James Baldwin. And I remember one of the lines was, all safety is an illusion. I was like, what is he talking about? And now that I'm 40, I know exactly what that means, <laughs> right? So this idea that I'm supposed to be safe or I feel safe and all safety is an illusion so I think for me, using my privilege and then learning when to speak and when not to speak. Um, I mentor quite a few DACA recipients, right? There's about, I don't know if you know this, there's about 800,000 DACA recipients across the country. These are dreamers, right? And people don't realize that the DREAM Act was not, has not passed nationally, right? Actually, the first hearing on the DREAM Act was supposed to be on the day of 9-11, and they had to cancel it. And since then, we have not passed the DREAM Act. Right? That's why there's 21 states, including Minnesota, that has to figure out what are you going to do with all these young people. So there's 800,000 of them who have DACA. Unfortunately, I aged out of it. I was three months too old for, for DACA. But what we're hearing is that this government the Biden-Harris administration may struggle to keep DACA. So what's going to happen when 800,000 people who are now professional, who are now workers across all industries, right? What happens when they lose their legal status? So I, for the past few months, hearing from a lot of DACA recipients who are, you know, depressed and dealing with mental health issues and dealing with, actually just last week, I spoke to somebody who's decided to leave. Hmm. Um, she said she can't live her life like this um, in two year increments because you have to keep getting renewed. So, and again, just to contextualize, right? So the DACA recipients, our kids who grew up here, you know, this is their home. They have to pay this government $500 every two years so that the government doesn't deport them and so that they can work and pay taxes to the government that wants to deport them. If we went around Minnesota, I wonder if we asked all the young people who grew up here what they would do to pay for their citizenship. Would they pay the $500 fee? I don't know. They may be like, hey, give me the money. I'll go to Mexico on a vacation. <laughs> right? So... This woman that I was talking to that decided to leave, she contacted me because she felt guilty, she said. She said, I feel bad that I'm going to leave, and yet you've stayed. 
And then I had to tell her that, you know, I actually thought about leaving, but then I decided not to, and that that is your decision. Right? Freedom of movement means freedom to come and then freedom to go. And guess what? Wherever you end up going, I won't name the country that she's going to go to, um, you'll always have America with you. It doesn't, like, go away, right? I mean, to this day, <laughs> America to me is like Mark Twain, it's James Baldwin, it's Toni Morrison, it's Bill Moyers on PBS, it's Frasier, it's 227 that's now streaming on Amazon Prime. You know, like, it doesn't go away, right? So that was a really, really tough conversation that was had privately, right? So, like, things that I can't say publicly, privately, all of those things, I think, factor in when you become a public person, whatever that means. A number of questions have come forward about uh, your status as a citizen, uh, which you are not. Uh, have you thought about applying? How difficult would it be to become a citizen? Uh, are you being taxed without having any representation? So that's a really, I'm glad somebody asked that question because that to me is emblematic of how, emblematic of two things. One, the fact that most Americans, and again, before the pandemic, I was traveling all across the country. The number one question I get asked, it doesn't matter if, they're, if they voted for Trump or they were Bite or they were uh, Sanders people, it didn't matter what the political orientation was. The number one question I got asked was that, why can't you just get legal? <laughs> As if like all I gotta do is like flip a switch and oof, I'm a citizen, right? So there are 11 million undocumented people because there's actually no process for the 11 million people, including the 100,000 undocumented people in Minnesota to follow. That's why we're waiting for quote unquote immigration reform. The immigration reform that they tried to like tack to this budget bill that the parliamentarian was like, wait a second, right? This immigration reform that I'm not quite sure is gonna pass anytime soon. So because immigration is not one size fits all, right? My own situation is kind of complicated. So before I came out as undocumented, I met with 28 lawyers, immigration lawyers all of whom said, you cannot do this. Like, people like you are, are supposed to be quiet, <laughs> right? We're here, but we're not here, right? It's kind of like this, you know, we know, visibly invisible. And then, the, I will never forget, the woman from the Stanford Law Clinic, Law School Clinic said to me, the moment you come out as undocumented, we can't do anything to help you because you're outing yourself and you're actually admitting to everything you've done to commit fraud just so you can work. So that's why, for example, you know, same-sex marriage is now legal. So I could, well, not, well, you don't need to know that. Um, if I wanted to, I could marry somebody, but I'm not, but I, well, even if I did marry somebody, I couldn't adjust my status because I've already admitted to all the fraud. Uh -huh. So meaning there's no, the only solution for me are three things right now. Wait for immigration reform that would actually pardon all of the fraud that people like me have had to commit. One option. Second option, ask for a private bill. Oh. I'm not gonna do that. Talk and about, then say what? Talk about privilege. Right? Yeah. Would, oh yeah, because I have this thing called a Pulitzer, Pulitzer, I didn't even know how to pronounce it when I got it. Like, it's only like a piece of paper, you can have it. My grandmother has it. You know, like, it doesn't mean that I'm more quote unquote worthy. The third option is, thanks to what Bill Clinton signed into law in 1996. So I would have to leave, accept what's called a 10-year bar, and try to come back, but no guarantee. 10 years. 10 years. So those are the three options, for me, specifically. So instead of trying any of those, you I'm not going to. I've, I've already made the private bill decision like a decade ago. Yeah. I remember talking, because you know, I used to work in DC, I used to be a political reporter, so I know a lot of people in DC, and they were like, hey, you can just be quiet about this, and you know, maybe we can figure out, talk to somebody at the State Department. I couldn't do that, um, and I can't do that. I just don't, this gets us to this question of citizenship, right? Like, I made a decision 10 years ago that when I am asking this question, how do you define American, I actually mean all Americans. I don't mean college educated, English proficient, right? Frazier quoting Americans. I mean all Americans. 
And I actually think this struggle for inclusivity is a test that all of us have to put ourselves in. When you mean all, do you really mean all? <laughs> or your definition of all? Is your definition sufficient? Do you know enough? I don't know. I know that I don't. Right. Number of questions have come forward about your various identities. Oh. Undocumented, Filipino, Asian, Asian American, gay man. The questions, are particularly from the students, around your identities. How, is, how does your identity or your various ways of identifying fuel who you are and how you're speaking out? Okay, this may be a, not a good way to answer this. Here's my worry, and I'm grappling with this myself. How do we use, I'm, an undoc I'm undocumented, I'm gay, I'm Filipino, I'm a journalist, I'm a filmmaker, I'm now producing plays, I'm working on, actually, I'm, I'm working on writing my first play, I'd never written a play before. The most important identity for me is actually the identity that fuels my work, which is that I tell stories, that's what I do. And to be honest, I've spent the past decade trying to make sense of my own story, and now I'm ready to kind of move on to other stories, right? Like, I'm working on a play now that has literally nothing to do with my identity. And it's so thrilling <laughs> and liberating to not think about my own perspective as an undocumented gay Filipino. My worry though, and I say this to my nieces and nephews who are college age, is how do we use our identities as bridges and not as walls? How do we say, I hope, I would hope, that you don't have to be an undocumented gay Filipino to want what I want, right? And to need what I need. And sometimes I think identity gets used as this way to say, oh, nope, sorry, not allowed. And I'm striving to create a body of work in books, in film, in TV, in theater, that is borderless. I want the work to exist in all these different mediums and forms. And at the same time, to do it in such a specific way that it becomes universal. And so I would hope that we use our identities as a way to get specific so we can talk about the universality that we all share. You know, Maya Angelou, when I went to the Westminster website, I saw that you quoted this great quote from Maya Angelou. I met Maya Angelou. I didn't meet her. I met her on Oprah. Remember when Oprah, when I was a kid, the three o'clock to five o'clock was the Rosie O'Donnell show and the Oprah Winfrey show. And everything I know about books and popular culture came from those two hours. <laughs> and to, I remember um, Oprah Winfrey had Maya Angelou as her guest and Maya Angelou was saying, I know that what unites us is far greater than what divides us. I was in seventh grade when I heard that. I had mm. no idea what she was talking about. Mm. And then I'm a little bit obsessed with Maya Angelou. I recently watched the documentary about her. There's quite a few. But I guess when she was a young girl, she, was, she, was, she became a mute. She didn't speak. This is what had happened to her. And she read every book at the library, at the black library, and she read this, this person named Shakespeare. She had no idea who this person Shakespeare was. But there was a play, and Maya Angelou said, this Shakespeare must be a black woman. <laughs> How can this Shakespeare know what it feels like to be a woman who's been violated? Now, that is all I need to know about identity, right? That this black woman from the South <laughs> Shakespeare a black woman? How could Shakespeare know? So I, I endeavor for that kind of community and humanity. Thank you everyone for being here for this Westminster Town Hall Forum broadcast with Jose Antonio Vargas. Thank you, Mr. Vargas, for your Thank you.
Some, sometimes when a speaker is really good, I suggest they should run for office. Oh. <laughs> you can't run for office until you're documented, right. Uh, I'm really grateful for this conversation. We're off the air now. I just want to uh, let you all know.